Please open your Bibles, if you have one, to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. You'll find the outline for the notes in the bulletin, or if you're watching from home, um, there in the link below on the church website. You can print those off. This morning, we will continue our study through Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. Um, Ephesians chapter 5, verses 3 through 14, part 2. Last week, we looked at this section, um, the beginning and We'll look at the second half this week. I'd like to begin our time by reading Ephesians 5, 3 through 14. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you. As is proper among saints, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partakers with them. For at one time you were darkness, but now... You are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Lord God, we thank you that you have made us children of light. You have saved us, that you have adopted us, that you have given us a new nature. Help us to learn how to walk in light, and help us to accomplish that. We need your grace both to see and to receive and to understand from your word. And we need your grace to apply it and to live it out. So help us to understand what you have for us and help us to leave here more brightly shining. In Jesus' name, amen. Our passage this morning comes closely on the heels and is linked um, very tightly with last week's message. So if you remember last week, We looked at Paul's warning of specifically sins to avoid which mark the unbelievers. We looked at sexual morality, impurity, and covetousness. And then the subset, the the language sins that, that will often lead to that greater fruit, the foolish talk, crude joking, filthiness. And said, let there be thanksgiving. And then we considered Paul's sober warning that people who are marked by, defined by those sins, will not inherit the kingdom of God. They will not go to heaven, but instead the wrath of God is in store for them. That was was heavy to consider last week. This week, hopefully, will be more encouraging, more of a positive outline as Paul gives us yet another one of our walks. We've seen in Ephesians that Paul regularly has used this metaphor of walk as he leads us through his ethical instruction. The second half of the book, laying out how we're supposed to live our lives. Because, of course, in the ancient world, you, you walked where you're going. So the idea is living your life day by day. And here's a new walk. We've already seen back in chapter 4, verse 1, we're to walk in a worthy manner. In 4.17, we're to walk no longer as the Gentiles do. In chapter 5, verse 2, walk in love. And this morning, walk as children of light. There's one more. Next week, we'll look at in verse 15, walk not as unwise, but as wise. So walking as children of light. The Bible has many metaphors to describe our salvation, many metaphors to describe who and what we are. We've already used metaphors of being dead and now being alive. We've used metaphors of alienation, being brought into sonship and daughtership. This morning, we look at the metaphor of darkness and light. We're going to look at it in four points. We'll dive in with our first point. Do not become partakers 
with them. Do not become partakers with them. Now the them are those who practice such things that we saw back in verse 6. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partakers with them. With who? With the sons of disobedience. With those who practice such things. So last week's warning was not to live these things. Now, we're beginning with a distancing, a separating ourselves from these things. This even links back to the first command we saw back at the beginning of the chapter to imitate God. Verse 1. Don't imitate and join with People who do such things imitate God. Do not become partakers. The notion of partaker here is when it was a share in a possession or in a relationship. It's used a chapter or two earlier. If you turn back to chapter 3, the only two places this word is used in the New Testament is in chapter um, in chapter 3, verse 6. The mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. That we're fellow participants. And so the warning here is do not become fellow participants with those who do such things. We're to distance ourselves. There's to be some note of separation, distinction. Not only must we not do these things, but we ought not to be in association in those in that activity. Now, to which we can ask the question, does this refer to believers or unbelievers? It refers to anyone who's marked by these things. If anything, the Bible would give a stricter warning about believers in habitual sin. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 9 through 11, Paul says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all meaning the sexually immoral of this world or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters, since then you would need to go out of the world. But now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of a brother if he is guilty of sexual morality or greed or is an idolater, a reveler, a drunkard, or a swindler, not even to eat with such a one. So on the one hand, those who profess Christ who live this way, we are to extremely distance ourselves. Now those in the unbelieving culture, Paul makes it clear, we're not to go out of the world. The, the command here is not to participate with them in those activities. So as they gather to do these things, as they tell these jokes, you're not laughing. You're you're distancing yourself. Now what's interesting here is Paul's motivation for this. Because he shifts here from his previous um, motivation to a new reason. You may expect Paul to say, do not become partakers with them because wrath's coming upon them. Because of What awaits them? And you don't want to be there with them when what awaits them comes upon them. That's not his reasoning. That was last week's reasoning. Last week's reasoning is fight like hell against these sins or you may go there. To put it really simply, make war. Don't let these sins dominate you. And and Paul puts heaven and hell, wrath and a reward as his motivating factors. Here, that's not his reasoning. Your blank here is... We're to do this not because of their fate, but because of your new nature. Because of your new nature. We've seen this before and after, which we're about to see here again as well in in previous passages. You see that here. You were at one time, but now. Turn back to chapter 2. If you remember those two big before and afters in chapter 2 of Ephesians that make up the whole chapter where Paul uses two big contrasts, right? So in chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, and the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. There's the before. But now, God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. So the axis of that before and after is being dead and being a slave to being alive and to be free and to be raised and reigning with Christ. 
And then the next before and after had to do with distance and alienation, right? Therefore, verse 11, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. So here the axis was you were far off without God, aliens and strangers in a hostile relationship with God and with God's chosen people. Now you've been brought near. And so now Paul's going to use another then but now. And here the, the, the imagery is of darkness and light. And so Paul tells us that the reason we are to not partake with, to not join in with, to not be in relationships, shared relationships centered around such activities with those who practice them, is because God's given us a new nature. It's, it doesn't comport with who we are in Christ who we've been made to be in Christ for at one time, but now. And he says, for at one time you were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Now, notice what it doesn't say. It does not say at one time you were in darkness. That would be true. People who have walked in darkness have seen a great light. Paul is saying something much stronger. He's not saying we were in darkness and then we're placed into light. We were darkness. Now we are light. Now what does he mean by darkness? Turn back to chapter 4. He's already used this metaphor speaking of the unbelievers, right? Verse 18. I'll go back to 17. Now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do. In the futility of their minds, they are darkened in their understanding alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. So what does Paul mean by darkness? I'm going to suggest for you it means error, ignorance, and evil. And, and you could add on hardness of heart. And so what Paul is saying is not that we were in this and surrounded by this, but, but it came from within us. It emanated from us. Our heart was a heart of darkness. Our heart was a heart of error and hardness and ignorance, and evil. Yes, we were enslaved to the world system, but we were also loving our master. We were darkness. By the way, that's another statement of the depravity of man. Paul does not say there was a good dog and a bad dog in you. Rather, there was darkness through and through, head to toe. That was our nature. That is who we formerly were. And there's no modifier. It, it, just, it just fits right upon us. What I mean by no modifiers, you'll notice there is a modifier in the next one. The light is in the Lord. It's perfectly natural for us to be darkness. Darkness is the natural state of fallen man. It doesn't have to try hard. My, my, even my new twins don't have to try hard. Darkness is cute darkness, but it's darkness that emanates from their hearts, their desires. This is our natural state. There's no one else to blame. It's our true state. We were darkness. And thankfully, the but now doesn't have to wait a few verses like it did back in chapter 2. It's right here. You were darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Now, this does need the in the Lord there because this isn't something we did on our own. This isn't some moral reform you didn't find that last little good bit in you and take hold of it and prove it. No. In the Lord, you have a new nature. In the Lord, you have a new character. And that's Paul's rationale for why we're to separate ourselves from those who do these things. This is a common enough imagery the Bible uses to speak of conversion. Listen to how Paul speaks in Acts 26, 18. 
explaining his ministry, that he was sent to open their eyes so they may turn from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins in the place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This is, this is a common metaphor. So light, then, I think, in this, in this context, means something like truth, knowledge, and holiness. Not hard-heartedness, open-heartedness to God, Truth as opposed to ignorance and error, and holiness as opposed to evil and malice. And that's, that's a wonderful statement. And again, it gets back to how we speak about ourselves as Christians. If you're a Christian, you're saying, I am a child of light. I am remade light. I was darkness, now I'm light. And it's not your doing, it's in the Lord, it's his doing. It's his doing. So that's the first construction or command. We are to break with, we're not to partner with people who do such things. This, this is not only going to be doing those things, but laughing at those things. Being entertained by movies where people do those things. Telling stories and jokes about those things. Because remember, it wasn't just the actions of immorality that Paul can end, but, but the joking and the, the talking about it. That I used the imagery last week of it's, it's a less mature tree, but if you let it grow, it will bear the greater fruit. We, we are not to become partakers. We're not to share in fellowship around those things. And then he gives us the next positive command, point two, walk as children of light. So he's declared we have this new nature. This is another way of speaking of what happened when you and I were saved. We were one thing through and through. It was our nature. It was our character. And now in the Lord, we are something different. And that difference is why Paul says we ought to not partake with, not share in these sins with the sons of disobedience. We are instead to walk as children of light. Last week, we saw that Paul's vices came in three triplets, right? So we saw in verse 3, sexual morality, impurity, and covetousness. There's your first triplet. Then in verse 4, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking. Second triplet. Verse 5, you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure, who is covetous, there's your third triplet. Here we're going to get a triplet of righteous fruit, of positive fruit, of light fruit. The fruit of light. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true. So walk in, your blanks here, goodness, righteousness, and truth. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. Goodness is the opposite of malice that's mentioned in chapter 431. But that which is helpful, beneficial both in its motive and its effect. Righteousness, that which is right and holy and fitting and just. And of course, truth as opposed to a lie. This is what should mark our daily walk. This is the fruit that you should see in children of light. If if you are a child of light, this is the fruit that will be bearing more and more in your life. In fact, in one way, this is one of the ways we can confirm our salvation So, you say, you're a child of light. Christ has shown in your heart you have been changed. Then that fruit ought to be more and more growing and appearing in your life. Goodness, righteousness, and truth. Turn back to chapter 4. This is all that we studied through the last few weeks. Remember verse 20 when Pastor Daniel was teaching this? That is not the way you learned Christ. I'm assuming that you've heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. So this truth that we're living out is a truth that's found in Jesus Christ. And that truth was we're taught to put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life. And it's corrupt through deceitful desires to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. All Paul's saying here is that those who've been born of light, those who've been made light, bear this fruit, goodness, righteousness, and truth. And we're to walk in those things. These ought to be the things that more and more mark our daily living. They mark our daily living. 
that, that triumvirate, goodness, righteousness, and truth, is similar to what Paul tells the Philippians in chapter 4, verse 8. Remember, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything, any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. That, that's the same type of idea here. And there's a lot of room for good, just, true fruit. So There's a wide open field for, for acts of love and mercy and justice and truth. The second thing we are to do is discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Discern what is pleasing to the Lord. We already read in chapter 2 that Christ on the cross abolished the law of commandments expressed in ordinances. You see, one of the amazing things in the New Covenant is that there is a freedom. Paul says in Galatians, if you walk in the Spirit, against this there's no law. And here, the way we discern God's will is by reading Scripture, but there's a sense in which each and every one of us is figuring it out as we move along, as we encounter instructions. Again and again, we don't simply have a list of rules to go to, but walk in goodness, walk in righteousness, walk in truth. In this way, you will grow in discerning, approving, Proving, even, you could translate it, what is pleasing to the Lord. Again, very similar to something Paul says elsewhere, Romans 12. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. And by testing, you may discern, there's that word, what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Slightly different triplet there. And so as Christians, what we're doing is more and more bearing this fruit, growing in these things. And we are more and more learning what pleases our Father. That, that's what we should be doing. Not partnering with those who hate God and upon whom his wrath comes, but rather separating ourselves, at least insofar as they are doing those things, and bearing a very, very different fruit. Very different fruit. Walk as children of light. Walk as children of light. Then we see in verse 11 and 12 the following. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. Instead, expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. So positively, what does it mean to be light? Well, positively is a shining forth of goodness and righteousness and truth. Positively, there's a growing learning and understanding and discerning what is pleasing to our Father. Negatively, and this is almost a restatement of what he said back in verse 7, there is a having, I have here, no fellowship with the works of darkness. The word translated here means fellowship together with, or partnering together with, or association. Soon koinonion. We are not to be associated with the works of darkness. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness. And again, Can you imagine dark light? Light ought not, ought not, cannot be stained by darkness. If we are light, then how much of our life should be engaged in darkness? None, right? Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. I'll deal with that expose them in just a minute because he picks it up again in verse 13. I just want to focus on what he says around that. There's, there's two further reasons given why we ought to have nothing to do with the unfruitful works of darkness. Um, he's already told us we have this new nature. It's not who we are anymore. But notice he says they're unfruitful. They may be pleasurable for a time. They may be enjoyable for a few moments. But they do not bear good fruit. They don't have good consequence. They're unfruitful. They're barren. This is what Jesus speaks of when he warns about the seed that is sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. Unfruitful. God God intends, he desires us to bear fruit. And in in mixing those metaphors back up in verse 9, the fruit of light, but the works of darkness are unfruitful. They are unfruitful. Not only are they unfruitful, they are shameful. They are shameful. 
Not, not only is doing and, and engaging in these works shameful, speaking about them, naming them is shameful. This gets back to why telling jokes about such things, laughing at movies about such things, is shameful. It's not simply enough to know what is true and right. Our hearts and affections need to respond rightly. We should love what is lovely, hate what is hateful, be ashamed of what is shameful. And so here Paul's indication of distancing ourselves from these things, we're we're to not partake with them, we're to take no part in them. They're shameful even to speak of. And what's also interesting is that the unbelievers know it. Why? Why? Because they do them in secret. Even as our culture more and more hardens its heart, glories in its shame, there's still many, many things that they know are shameful that they won't do publicly. Because God's given us a conscience. And so we know, even people of darkness know, something about right and wrong, good and evil. And so we're to have no fellowship with those things. Those jokes that you wouldn't want your wife or your kids to hear, God doesn't want to hear. It's shameful to even speak of these things. That, that's how far removed and distance we're to be. Back, back in verse um, 3, right? We saw sexual immorality and all impurity and covetousness must not even be named among you. Here, there's things that are not to be spoken among us. You know, shameful. Now, the light has its, I'll call it sort of passive effect and its active effect. The, the passive effect is light shines, right? And so we, we bear this fruit. We, we bear lives of goodness and justice and truth. But in verse 13 and 14, we're going to see an even more active and powerful effect of light. He, he said it first in verse 11, extend, extend, expose them. And he picks that theme up in 13 and 14. For, anything is ex, for when anything is exposed by light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. And now we move to expose the works of darkness. Expose the works of darkness. Of darkness. So light reveals itself in its own nature, but light has an effect on darkness in a way that darkness doesn't have an effect on light. Remember in John chapter 1, the light has come into the world and the darkness did not comprehend it, did not reach out and, and take hold of it. Well, that's the other effect of light. You and I as children of light, what it means to walk as children of light, on the one hand, is to li- Live lives that bear the growing, fuller, more mature, more mature fruit of goodness, righteousness, and truth. But now we're looking at the light's effect as it relates to darkness. Rather than joining with, partnering with, laughing with, engaging with those who are doing such things, we are to expose them. What what does that mean, to expose them? And we got to be careful here because it... if we take this the wrong way, this, this could turn us into sort of um, picket, sign-holding, looking down our nose, mocking, scorning, judging people. And, and I think that's not exactly what Paul has in mind here. So what does it mean to expose them? Well, Paul's movement is first that light identifies. We identify their works with the light of truth, identify their light, works with the light of truth. Things become visible. So they're, they're doing things. They're doing them in secret. And the reason you're doing things in secret is because you want to hide them because he says this is shameful to even speak of them. You don't really want to know what it is. The person who's, who's addicted to drugs doesn't want to know how bad it is. The person who's got a bad temper wants to pretend it's not as bad as he thinks it is. And so one of the things light does, and by light here, again, we're getting back to truth. As Paul's already told us back in chapter 4, that is truth that is in Jesus Christ. So it's not my opinion or your opinion. But the light of God's truth, the light of the gospel, identifies the works of evil. One of the challenges for us as Christians is we don't have the authority to call sin other than what God calls it. Let me say that again. We don't have the authority to use euphemistic language 
and call sin other than what God calls it. Now, there are plenty of times where you just need to keep your mouth shut. If you're being paid and you're on the job, your employer's not paying you, I don't think, to, to give, you, give him lectures on morality. But where it's fitting and where it's appropriate for us to speak, our words and our conduct ought to reveal the true nature of sin and darkness. Not on our authority, but on God's. And again, we, we need to do this, and the rest of Scripture gives us further indication, seasoning our words with salt so that we'll know how to give an answer to every man. But we can't go along with our culture when our culture wants to say, this is just fine, isn't it? And we, we dare not say, uh, yeah, it's okay. We're not being light at that way. We're, we're actually being contaminated by darkness. We expose the works of darkness. Um, So we dare not agree that evil is good or that good is evil, but we identify their works with the light of truth. We need to call sin what it is, do it in love, do it in an appropriate way, but we can't compromise on these things. Where, Where God has spoken, we can either speak what he has said, agree with him, or we can disagree with him and agree with the culture. But God's intention is that his children of light, walking in light, would identify, bring, bring clarity to, reveal its true nature, the works of darkness. Now what's amazing here is that's not where the light stops. We see that first it becomes visible, right? Anything that's exposed by the light becomes visible. That's the first movement. But then in verse 14, he presses it even further. Anything that becomes visible is light. What do you mean, Paul? Well, there's a movement here. There's a movement from identifying to convicting, to convicting. Really, the word expose could be even to convict their works with the light of truth. Um, it's the word actually translated in the, the Greek translation of Leviticus 19, 17. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor. You shall challenge your brother. You shall... Um, Rebuke your brother, even. And so when it says exposing the light, there's more than just making it visible. There's, a, there's even a challenge to it. And again, this is where we need to be careful. We need to do this in love. We need to do this with wisdom. But as the light of God's word reveals sin, there is an implicit rebuke, is there not? There is an implicit call to change. Once your friends, once your neighbors, once your family understand that you think that this behavior, this activity is wrong, displeasing to God, there's an implicit call to change, which is where Paul goes to next, convert their works with the light of truth. And we don't convert anybody, but the light of God's truth converts. And and that's the movement. So verse 13, when anything is exposed by light, it becomes visible. So first you can see what it is, and anything that becomes visible is light. So somewhere in Paul's thinking, these things that are revealed become light. And he's not saying the works of darkness, these evil things, suddenly become light. Rather, I think they're changed into light. They're transformed into light. God uses his word and his truth to make new people This is how he creates his people. He creates his people with his word. He upholds his people with his word. And so what Paul is saying is one of the most powerful apologetics you and I have is a holy life coupled with a tongue that speaks the truth, names things as they are when it's appropriate, and that when we're bearing that fruit, the fruit of goodness and righteousness and truth, you're giving the Holy Spirit powerful tools to convict and work upon the hearts of unbelievers. We're not going along with them. We're not playing their games with them. We're not agreeing that evil is good, good is evil, up is down, left is right, whatever the new thing we're supposed to confess to the culture. Rather, we're speaking God's truth, and God uses that light first to expose And to convict, and then ultimately to convert the unbelieving heart. If you turn turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, um, we're going to look at it briefly this right now, and then we're going to look at it a little longer in a few minutes. So keep your finger here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. This this is a way to speak of salvation. There, There are a number of ways you can speak of salvation, and one of them is in this language of light, right? It's one of my favorite passages about conversion. 
Let's pick it up in verse 3. Now, the Apostle Paul here is explaining why it is that so many men and women perish. He doesn't want his readers to think it's because his gospel is just okay. It's a decent gospel. No, it's an amazing gospel he's been speaking about. And he wants to explain why it is. And Paul, he's anticipating, I think, Paul, if your gospel is so great, then why do so many people hate it? Why do so many people reject it? He says this in verse 3, even if our gospel is veiled, and is veiled to those who are perishing. Now, the picture of a veil is bringing the, the, the metaphor of sight and seeing. He's going to bring in darkness and light here in a minute. Our gospel is veiled to those who are perishing. So what he's saying is those who reject the gospel, those who reject Christ, those who when they hear the gospel want nothing of it, haven't really seen anything the way it really is. There's a veil that lines over their heart. They are blind. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. So why? One way you could say, why do people perish? Because they won't see light and glory in the gospel of Jesus Christ. You, You hold up Christ in his word, in his gospel, and they don't see anything beautiful and compelling. And it's not because Christ isn't beautiful and compelling. It's because they aren't seeing properly. So what's the cure for that? It's more light. And this time it's an inward light. Look at verse 6. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So the only way you and I can respond to the light of the gospel of the glory of God in Christ is if God first shines light in our hearts, removing the veil, we see. That's how you and I were saved. And so Paul, I think, using similar mentality, saying that, look, when truth is coming to bear with error, when, when the Spirit, we know his initial work, In John 15, he's going to convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. And so we're living holy lives. We're living good, righteous, and truthful lives. They're growing. They're they're imperfect, but they're growing. When we do that, and when we further expose the sinful works of darkness, when we identify them for what we are, and we name them rightly, when we speak of them rightly, and again, there's all the difference of whether you do this talking down to someone whether you do this as an act of love, as, as someone who was once darkness as well, whether you do this in love or self-righteousness, but when you do that, it brings a conviction, and then, hopefully, ultimately, they become light. You're holding up the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and hopefully God speaks light into their hearts. That's the progression Paul is anticipating here, because... And here's your next point, D. God's light either repels or it transforms. God's light either repels or it transforms. Now, there is another outcome. The other outcome is men loved the darkness and hated the light. And when you hold up the light, they scurry like cockroaches. That is the other possible response. Uh, In John 3, 19 to 21, Jesus says, This is the judgment. Light has come into the world. Men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil deeds hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. So as you're trying to expose darkness in a loving, kind, appropriate way, either your unbelieving family member, friend, neighbor, is going to distance themselves from you, Because they don't want their evil deeds exposed. We've already seen that in Ephesians 5. They do it in secret. You start naming it rightly, speaking about it rightly. Or that light will begin to change them. That's what Paul, I think, has in view here. So God's light either repels or it transforms. If you're still in 2 Corinthians, turn back to chapter 2. Paul speaks about the same thing using another metaphor, an all-factory metaphor. Look at verse 14, 15, and 16. But thanks be to God, who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession, and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death. To the other, a fragrance from life to life. So as we're 
speaking God's truth, as we're declaring the gospel, some people smell it, and it smells like sewage. It smells like death. It smells like something rotting. And they cringe and whinge away. To others who God is saving, it smells like life. He's just using another sensory metaphor here. Whether it's sight and light, or whether it's the nose and the aroma, but God's light either repels or it transforms. When I'm witnessing to someone, when I'm sharing the gospel, honestly, the one response that bothers me the most is indifference. I I tend to think, I I must not be doing this right. Because you ought to either be hating this or loving this. You ought to either be growing in attraction and desire and an appeal to this gospel, or you ought to be growing in revulsion. So when I talk to someone, like, oh, that's interesting. I'm like, no, nah, I, I, I must have said something wrong. You're not understanding me. Let's try this again. Because God's light either repels or transforms. Men either love the light or they love the darkness. There's no third team, the twilight team. No, there's just, you love the darkness, you love the light. That's it. And here, Paul is envisioning, he's ultimately moving to how we were saved, that God made us light so that our light would shine. He made us light so that positively it could bear fruit, And he made us light so we could expose and identify, convict, and ultimately convert others. Then he quotes this. Therefore it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Which is interesting. This, this, This citation is probably one of the most challenging things in the text because Paul's introductory formula is identical to his introductory formula in Ephesians. We can go back to Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 8. In Ephesians chapter 4 in verse 8, he quotes Psalm 68. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. Here, therefore, it says, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. He's not actually directly quoting any Old Testament passage. What it is, is an adaptation, a Christian adaptation of Isaiah 26, 19, and Isaiah 60, 1 and 2. Let me, let me read these both to you. So Isaiah 26, 19. Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. Those who dwell in the dust awake And sing for joy, for your dew is a dew of light. The earth will give birth to the dead. So here is this picture of awaking from death. And oftentimes this metaphor of sleep is a metaphor for death. Remember in 1 Corinthians 11, he says there are people who are getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. There are people doing it wrong. And he says because of this, because you didn't examine yourselves, many are dead and now sleep. So this awake fits in perfectly with this previous metaphor of being dead. And here, awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine in you. Now, the other passage in Isaiah that this is meshing is Isaiah 60, 1 through 2. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples, but the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will be seen upon you. By the way, there's an interesting note here. Uh, this Christianization of this text has made one alteration, has it not? Isaiah, the glory of the Lord, the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. The glory of the Lord will arise upon you. His glory will be seen upon you. Whose glory is it in Ephesians 5? Christ will shine. Thus, who does Paul and the early church think Christ is? The Lord, all caps, that's Yahweh. This is another strong statement for the deity of Christ. Paul, I don't know who composed this um, statement, who made this arrangement, adaptation, whether it was Paul or whether he's citing a song or, or, a, or a poetic statement that the early church had coined, but they took, he or they took Isaiah twenty six nineteen and 60 verse 12, and then adapted it, sort of like we do when we sing the Psalms. We'll we'll adapt Psalms. We we sang Psalm 24 this morning. It was an adaptation of that. And they swapped out the glory of the Lord for Christ shining because they understood the glory of the Lord is Christ. 
Glory to the Lord is Christ. And so Paul is citing this, not as a text of Scripture, but rather as, as a saying that is said, a taking of Scripture and an adapting it with, with Christian truth. And taken that way, I think he's describing, and here's the blank, this is how we were saved. This is how we were saved. He's explaining the process of how light first exposes and reveals and makes visible and then turns into light. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. We were dead. Remember chapter 2, we were dead. And what did God do, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. We awoke from death. We arose from the dead. We were made anew. Ephesians 2, verse 10, right? For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And now, the light, we are children of light, we're light in Christ, but here, Christ is the one shining on us. That's that's how we were converted. We were blind to God's glory. We were dead in our sins We were slaves to this world. We were by nature darkness. And God awoke us from our death. Christ shone upon us. And now with living hearts, with the veil removed, with eyes that could see, with ears that could hear, we saw that glory of the Lord. And what happens? We were converted and then we became light. You see, you get that? So God did a work in your heart that enabled you to see and rightly apprehend the gospel of Jesus Christ. And one day, you heard the gospel, you were reading God's word, and you saw glory. And then, what did God do? He turned you into light. He, He changed you from the inside out. I think the early church probably put this adaptation together as a way of remembering how they became Christians. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is the nature of light. God's light, when you saw it, converted and changed you, and now that same light can shine from you as children of light, both in the fruit of goodness, righteousness, and truth, and also in the additional consequence of how light exposes and reveals and convicts the darkness No, we're not supposed to partake with them. We're supposed to convert them. We're supposed to shine upon them. And God's glory and his light is supposed to have its work in their hearts and either drive them away or turn them into light. I'd be remiss this morning if I didn't consider the possibility that some even here today may not yet be light. And so this call... (laughs) is is a call to you that you might see, that you might behold the glory of the Lord, that you might awake and Christ might shine on you. So it's my prayer that as we we leave here this morning, we would leave as children of light, bearing the, the fruit of light, doing the work of light. And close with a word of prayer, call the worship team up and we'll sing our closing song. Lord God, we marvel And revel in the fact that you spoke life and light into our hearts. We were blind. You made us see. We were dead. and You made us alive. We were alienated from you. And you made us sons and daughters. And now it is your will that we live that new nature out for others to see. That we would bear the fruit that you have fashioned for us to bear. That you, we would walk in the paths that you have made for us to walk. That we would not be conformed to this world, but rather by our deeds, by our words, we would expose with the light of your truth the works of darkness. And that as that light shines, it would do its work on others as well. That others would be brought to know you. That others would bow the knee to King Jesus. That others would become sons and daughters of light as well. We can only do this by your help, with your grace. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask. Amen.